This is STARS Officer Jill Valentine, and you're listening to the Let's Talk Resident Evil podcast. What is going on, everyone? Anthony here, and welcome back to another episode of the Let's Talk Resident Evil podcast. And in today's episode, I will be reviewing Resident Evil Death Island, which is the latest CGI film, and it does take place in our game's canon. So I am very excited to talk about this today on this episode. And of course, if you didn't see the review that was about six minutes that I put up last week that was spoiler free, it's all good because this will be a spoiler discussion. So if you're on this video, I'm sure you've seen the film already. We're going to get into the deep stuff here, review it all, break it all down. Uh, I have a bunch of notes here and stuff highlighted that I want to talk about and discuss. And uh, we'll go through everything, you know, piece by piece here. So this will be a little bit of a longer form one, but that's why I wanted to make this a podcast review. The anticipation for this film was pretty big, and I think that goes into Jill and Leon finally meeting up, and Jill coming back for the first time since Resident Evil 5. So that took place in 2009. This takes place in 2015, so we finally get to see where she's been and how she's doing. And I know they brought her back in RE3 Remake, but that was 1998, so we get to see where they are in 2015 and a lot of fans were excited most of our ogs are coming back to take on the next threat and uh, we're going to get into exactly what makes this movie a pretty damn good cgi film and i think for a lot of people that were you know kind of hoping this was going to be worth the wait and hoping that this is going to be something that resident evil fans were able to take in as a hardcore fan and really understand the beats and the references this does a lot for the hardcore fan. And I think that's what a lot of these CGI films are for, mostly. Uh, because, you know, of course, there's just so much connection from a 27-year-old franchise. So there's a lot to talk about here and a lot to go over. So let's get into Resident Evil Death Island. The film opens up in Raccoon City in 1998, and we see Dylan, who is a part of this Umbrella Squad. They are driving in and they are told to take out civilians if they push back against the orders and essentially that happens in true umbrella fashion now it cuts to a few moments later when dylan is with the rest of the comrades that are all bit the hell up and of course they are turning and umbrella pretty much tells them yeah we're not gonna bring anybody that's infected you got to kill them you got to take them out so it's him and his comrade dylan and his comrade that are left, which is, you know, of course, his friend or one of his closer friends. Uh, and, you know, he's against it. He's like, we got to do what we got to do. And Dylan's like, no. And he's pushing the gun. He shoots the bullets into his leg, which is why he also has the cane that we see a little bit later. And uh, it cuts away from that, you know, um, because it kind of fills it in a little bit more. And then come to find out that, you know, he beats his head in with a fucking uh, a case, I think, because he runs out of ammo. So very... Uh, connected in the roots of raccoon city is kind of what we see in the beginning and it makes sense because they're trying to show his background his backstory a little bit even though i think in my opinion he's probably one of the more weaker moments of this thing very very forgettable you know in, in many ways but that's not saying you know again i he was the worst villain ever and he wasn't entertaining to any degree but he just didn't really hold a a lasting impact i guess but they got to give him some backstory so cuts to San Francisco in 2015 and we see Leon on his bike and uh, Hunnigan is telling him about Antonio Taylor who is someone who works for the US military but he has leaked information and uh, they needed to get him like yesterday so Leon has to kind of put the pedal to the metal quite literally and it's uh, right into a highway chase to kick off the film uh, and I like that they have something like this in here of course they always got to have Leon in a vehicle or a bike uh, that's, you know, sponsored and stuff like that. But it, it's cool to see another highway chase. And, of course, this one is with Leon and Maria because Maria from Vendetta comes out of nowhere. She has her own bike. She's flipping around. Leon's trying to shoot her. And uh, she flips his bike. Leon's like, damn, I really like that bike. And uh, then it cuts to Claire. So it kind of shows each character where they are, what they're currently doing, because, of course, this case connects them together. So uh, it cuts to Claire, who is part of TerraSave still, and it cuts to an orca that's been completely chomped, and it wasn't done by a shark, uh, obviously. And Claire is like, yeah, they don't, they don't mess with orcas, so this is, uh, this is looking like something else. 
something else that's T virus related. Uh, and that's what we pretty much, you know, get from that little scene. So she walks on the beach, takes the measurements, sees the size of the bite. And she's like, yeah, this, this doesn't look good. So it's giving them little things to all connect in the middle. It then cuts to Jill who is making her entrance looking very tactical and has, you know, the flashlight, she has the handgun, she's ready to go. They tell her over the radio, you know, don't go in there, wait for BSAA, don't do it. And she just cuts them off, goes in anyway. You know, she's looking around the corners. She looks very, I guess, refreshed, I guess, in a way, where she seems like she's been out of it for a while. It's been six years. We don't know exactly when her start date of coming back was, but I'm assuming this is, like, very close to it because... There's a lot of moments that make you say, okay, I could see how she's like trying to get back into the swing of things with how these conversations are going. But also she finds a zombie. She finds a dead body. The zombie attacks her and she's immediately like brought to the floor, which is very strange. You know, you expect Jill to like kind of be on it. And like, I know the zombie kind of gets the one up and knocks, you know, the shit out of her hand. But like, it's very interesting to see her struggle with a zombie because, I mean, think about the last time she actually fought a zombie like this. It's been a long time. Not even in Resident Evil 5 that she had anything like this happen. So it brings her to the floor, and she's struggling. She kicks herself off. They fly through a glass table. She pops them off, kills them. BSAA come charging in. Chris comes in says, she's with me. But then he's like, what the hell? Why are you doing this why are you going in here and she just kind of blows them off just kind of walks away already kind of being a moodier jill more attitude more more uh stress that i feel like she's under at this moment um and i think that's the one thing that you take away from jill in this is that you know she's trying to cope with the events from re5 not even just re5 but just everything that kind of got layered on throughout the years and it makes me wonder like how much they actually talk to each other how much they actually communicate because she's still with the bsaa you know it still seems that she's with them she's not you know just by herself but she's trying to take things into her own like hands into her own orders so it makes me wonder like where she is in that kind of command they don't really talk about it that much with bsaa we know they're obviously still around but we just don't know like where she is currently you know, we didn't know if she was going to be more behind the scenes at first when we saw her in this film and then she was going to get back on combat. But no, she's like in there in the thick of it, almost getting, you know, killed. And that's why Chris is concerned is because, uh, you know, she could have got killed. Why did you go in before, you know, I said go basically. So there's that kind of going on right from the beginning, that kind of push and pull between Chris and Jill. And now it cuts to Chris and Rebecca back at the lab. And Rebecca is still the scientist, you know, the smart person at the computer doing all the stuff and, and doing research too, doing some investigating because she realizes that the victims, the 12 victims that showed up, they had no bite marks on them. They weren't bitten. They were infected with an enhanced version of the T virus and the people that they killed from bite marks didn't turn. So very strange, you know, what's going on, but we kind of know from you know, what happens in the middle of this thing that they are in fact getting, you know, bit by these little viral drones that go around and they pretty much bite and infect targeted people. And so it's a very different type of way of infecting, which I thought was kind of cool. I thought that was a different way of them approaching it um, because then it's like, okay, they're not just turning uh, just by the bite marks. It's just like, okay, if Whoever has control of the drones can infect anyone at any time. So that kind of poses that threat. And a lot of these cases that are coming up, of course, even in Claire's case, it's a bite mark that she saw in an orca, contains a T-virus. The virus is also not airborne, and it can't even be spread through saliva. So it's a different type of enhanced T-virus that they have going on here. And they kind of go into a serious conversation, which I really enjoyed. I know they showed it in the trailer. I kind of wish they held back a little bit from this conversation, but then they talk about Jill and they talk about, you know, what that has done to her, you know, what, what the events that Wesker has done. They mentioned that specifically being brainwashed by Wesker and trying to kill us. And, you know, that's not her fault. That isn't her fault, you know? And Rebecca is like, yeah, but like she knows it's not your fault, but she thinks it's her fault. She blames herself like that's in her head 
that's why she feels the way that she feels, you know? And it's not because there's, you know, I guess like a, an end to these fights, but she knows she has to keep going on with that on her mind. So her approaching these missions in a very like, I'm doing this to save whoever I can, it kind of makes sense to see Jill in that mindset of just like, I am going to to do this. I, you know, now that I'm back out here, I have to make my mark. Like first time since those events, I'm back out here. What can I do? Like, how can I do this? And Chris comes in, tries to talk to Jill. Obviously Jill's just very, just laser focused, has the earphones on, just shooting. Um, and, you know, Chris tells her that, you know, she should take some time off. He's like, yo, which makes me question, like, how long has she been back? Because it's like, you need to take some time off. She, I don't think she just started if he's saying take some time off. So maybe she's been in it a little bit up until this point. And he's like, you got to take some time off. And she just, she, she pretty much just gets emotional. You know, she reflects on Wesker's control. She says, you know, I, I couldn't, I had no consciousness like I couldn't control what I was doing I knew who I was trying to kill I knew I was trying to kill you guys but I didn't want that to happen it was that like helpless feeling and you can tell it was really affecting her and it's a very good scene very well done and I like the fact that we get them opening up to each other because let's face it they've been in it since the beginning and all of them have dealt with their own forms of you know whether it's PTSD or you know, survivor's guilt. And that goes right into what Chris is, you know, saying in the scene. And I want to kind of talk about these moments. This is why I'm kind of talking about it point by point, because it's very interesting. You know, he mentions Pierce. He mentions Pierce from Resident Evil 6. And uh, man, that was a, I, I did not expect that. I did not expect him to discuss anything from RE6. Not, not that like, you know, the events didn't happen or anything like that, but like, I just wasn't ready for it. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, damn. And uh, you see how that hurt him. You know, he says, I want, I wanted Pierce to take over for me when we were done that mission. And instead he sacrificed himself to save me, you know? And um, I think that's a very cool thing for them to kind of reflect on because Jill wasn't around for that. So it makes me wonder. It's almost like he's saying this to Jill for the first time in the scene. Cause he's like, Oh, well there is this guy Piers who I was with. Like, you know, it's not like he says, yeah, remember Piers who I told you about? Like, no, like it was, it, it seems like he's saying it for the first time to Jill. So it's very interesting with how, that is because it's like okay how close are Chris and Jill still I mean clearly they're still friends and they're close but like how much do they share with each other because RE6 took place in 2012 2013 so it took place in that time because it time jumps obviously so this is two years after the the complete events two to three years after the complete events of RE6 so it, it makes sense that he would discuss it but maybe he just you know I don't expect someone to just pour out all their this is the dramatic shit I've been through once they've just been through their own experience coming back to the front line. So I, I get it. But it was just the way he said it made it uh, seem like it was the first time he was telling Jill this, which is cool because we know that Jill was absent during that time. And Chris doesn't blame Jill for going into the house. He says, I would have done the same thing, you know, but he just says that sometimes doing this over and over again, you get numb to it. And within getting numb, you can get kind of locked in, zoned in. And sometimes you can go into situations where you might not come out alive because every mission is a sacrifice, you know. Um, and uh, Jill kind of snaps back, you know, because he's, he's like that can, you know, burn a hole through your soul. And, and she's just like all that bullshit, getting numb, burning a hole through your soul. That's horseshit, you know. The, the people, we got to be stopping the people that are causing the problems. Those are the people that are soulless. So very, um, very uh, moody Jill in this. V very, um, and she obviously just puts on the, the, the earphone, starts shooting, and, J and Chris is just like, uh, but, you know, like, what, what the hell? So, again, 
it, it goes back to those events kind of making her, shaping her, how she is now, how she's handling the situation. And I like seeing these moments. I like seeing this conversation with them. You know, I kind of wish it was a little bit more, uh, not stretched out, but I just wish that we got more of an emotional Jill out of this moment instead of her just being like, that's bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Because Chris is just trying to sympathize with her. And he wasn't trying to necessarily say that, like, I know you feel numb like I do. Like, he's just saying how his perspective was. Because a lot of this film kind of talks about them being pawns and, you know, they're working for these corporations, but who are they really working for? Or, you know, are they really making a difference? Those things do come up from our villain. But, you know, Jill's moody. She is moody. She is upset. There's been things she has to work through. Uh, or things she has to work through and things that have happened. But she's still Jill. She still feels like Jill. I, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, she's completely different than her character. Um, it's just a different side that we haven't seen because she's been through some shit. Then it shows Dylan and it cuts to him with Dr. Taylor, who of course is helping him with mass production with this virus so there's always got to be someone else but he plays Russian roulette with him and he plays it with himself so he's kind of like you know he has that crazy villain antic and of course he's got to pull out the revolver put the one you know bullet in the chamber and just that's the thing too I think they have you know this sense of like trying to make him seem intimidating you know what I mean but it you know it's a little a little cheesy it's not it's nothing that we haven't seen before and I'm all here for the cheese, man. D don't get me wrong. I'm here for the cheese. So it, it's just funny. And obviously you see Maria in the background because she's, you know, pretty much working with him now. And um, that is, you know, he doesn't shoot the doctor. He doesn't shoot himself. But every time he puts the gun to his head, he kind of flashes back to those moments uh, where he killed his comrade. And that's what still haunts him to this day. So you get a little bit of a... Of, of what's bothering him, how he's kind of going insane. Rebecca doing her research because, you know, she's probably a better detective than most detectives because she even said that the local police and the, the people that were investigating didn't notice any similarities, but she noticed a similarity that all of them were at Alcatraz Island and that's where they were visiting. So all of them are infected. So they're like, okay, well, we know where to start. Now, the virus is similar to other, you know, previous strains that they've had to deal with before. So Rebecca works on a cure during that time, which of course is a little, you know, pin to put in for later because of course they're going to come in handy. So Rebecca being smart and being on it, she's like, I'm going to develop this just in case. So she develops that while the rest of the gang goes to Alcatraz Island. So it's pretty much Chris, Claire, and Jill going on foot or sailing I should say uh in a, on a boat that just goes right there where Leon we meet up with him a little bit later but that's where the rest of the film does take place and it's a pretty cool setting obviously because now you're dealing with you know sharks and we did see the aquatic liquors which I'll get into in a little bit and of course our zombies so that's pretty much all you get in terms of the variety of BOW in this film but it does you know, kind of pace it pretty well. It does kind of get them to the island pretty quickly. It connects their cases in a way where you know why they're all getting together for this little reunion, so to speak. The one thing I wanted to mention, too, is when they're in the lab, it almost seems like even Chris is catching up with Claire. Uh, you know, obviously he's seen Rebecca, but it, it's kind of like he hasn't even really, you know, like, how's Tara save? And she's like, oh, it's a BSAA. Like, so it's... It's very, I, obviously I know they're all busy, they've been doing their own thing, but it just seems like they are they haven't been talking or catching up because, you know, Jill didn't even know about Piers, and then Chris and Claire are kind of like catching up like through this case, and that's why it kind of connects them here. And of course, as they get to Alcatraz Island, it literally doesn't take more than like three minutes for shit to hit the fan. And as Chris pretty much says that, shit hits the fan and people start getting infected. And we get a really cool scene with the jail cells and the zombies and we kind of get to see, you know, Jill really pull out her skills even more. She has the knife, she's flipping, she's jumping off walls. Very, very tactical, very well trained still. Uh, obviously, Chris does his thing, Claire does her thing, Claire trying to save as many people as she can. Um, but there's a lot of, like, 
what the hell moments because they're shooting the zombies, but then the people that are just, you know, hanging back behind a barricade, not even bit, are getting turned. And it's because of the drones biting them and they turn pretty quickly. Now, it's kind of funny because obviously <laughs> you see how fast they turn in this scene. And then later when our heroes get infected with it, they don't turn as fast. But it's it goes, you know, to that whole thing. The movie has to be a movie. And we also know that, like, they're not going to die because they literally are in other material past this point. So there is that safety there that you do feel, obviously. Like, we didn't expect any casualties from our main cast in this one anyway. But it's just that, like, you know, you just see that and you're like, okay, that's pretty funny. But it's still a cool way of infecting, you know, the people that are not even getting bit and are trying to be safe. Because if it's like the side, not even like you don't even see it. In, in the movie it's so small it's probably smaller than a fly you see it from the perspective like from the POV of the of the you know drone flying around but it's very small so you can't even see it you can't even stop it and it pretty much wipes out most of the crew because once he saw that of course you know Chris and Claire and Jill were on board he's like all right now we're gonna release this virus and that's how it happens shit hits the fan immediately and uh, there's like the, the ground opens up. Jill jumps down there and eventually gets separated from uh, the crew. And um, she has a uh, one of the security guards. You know, she hits him with the, the M16 because he turns into a zombie. She runs out of ammo and she's got the knife, doesn't even have a gun, got the knife. And she's going around through the tunnels trying to, to see, you know, how to get back to the others. And uh, Chris is like, where's Jill? You know, I got to find Jill because he's worried about her. And now we finally get the scene that us fans have been waiting for. Jill meeting Leon. And I love how it starts off. You know, Jill obviously doesn't have any weapons from the last scene. She has the knife. She's coming around the corner. She sees Leon's shadow. But you know that he sees her shadow too. Because as soon as she turns the corner, they're already fighting. They're, they're, they're you know, defending each other. She's flipping Leon. You know, they're, they're fighting. And then all of a sudden they stop and they're just like, Jill? Leon you know they, they just look at each other like what the hell we're meeting under these circumstances and uh, basically of course with Leon being in charge of trying to get Dr. Taylor that's what led him to the island so it brings everyone together and at this time we see the aquatic liquors in the one scene that we uh, we get but, but right before that the zombies are coming down the tunnel and, uh, you know, she doesn't have a weapon. She's like, got a gun. He just takes out a, a second handgun, gives it to Jill. She just joins in. I just love seeing the immediate teamwork. Like, you don't even have to say much to me. Like, we got each other's backs type of, you know, energy. And I like that. And, of course, the aquatic liquors come out. They look awesome. But this is the one scene that they're in. I wish they were a little more around other than just this scene. But a whole crate uh, of them comes out in the water. And, of course, it's the underground tunnels where the water is passing through. And, uh, you know, they have to hold for a second. The liquor comes up. Jill tries to be quiet. Something falls from a gas can, and they awake. And, of course, Leon immediately just shoots the one, <laughs> and they start running. Uh, they're grabbing Jill because Jill has never had to deal with the liquors. So, uh, obviously, they're in RE5, but she wasn't dealing with them in RE5. It was Chris and Sheva. So, it's kind of interesting to see her fighting liquors with Leon and Leon's been fighting them since pretty much the very beginning. So I, I love this scene right here. And, uh, you know, it ends with him just kicking a, a, you know, a canister in there, blowing them all up in true Leon fashion. And, uh, I just love it. I love the fact that we still get the little one liners in here. Just seeing them work together really just brings a smile on my face when I see it, because it's something that us fans, we finally got to see and Capcom did it very well. In this and it's not over like they still work together more in this film but that's just the first little scene that they get together and uh, it was very well deserved and well worth the wait I think so Leon and Jill continue down the underground passage in Alcatraz where a lot of the prisoners would escape and they find Dylan's lab and where he has all of the uh, the eggs hatching so to speak for the virus which is from liquors as well so the liquors that he has in the water is actually where they're hatching from so he just sees them kind of they're, you know, they're floating in the water and they're like, yeah, that, that doesn't look good. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, Dylan confronts, uh, you know, Claire and Chris, or he tries to, well, you know, doesn't really confront them before infecting them, but he essentially infects them with the drones. 
uh, while Jill and Leon are trying to figure out where Dylan is. So he, you know, calls over the radio. He's like, yeah, I got a, I got something for you. I got Claire and Chris and they're both infected uh, and they don't have much time left. So they go to the, uh, he says he's in the main cell block. He goes to the main cell block. And of course, Dylan is out there confronting, you know, Jill and Leon. Now during this conversation, he infects Leon. The only person he leaves uh, not infected at that point is Jill. But, you know, Leon's sitting there and he also gets, you know, gets bit and they all react. And again, it kind of makes them freeze up. They kind of can't move. They they drop, you know, their weapons. Usually they're, they're pretty frozen in that stance uh, of just like, you know, they're able to talk, but they're just like, they just feel like they're uh, they're dying. And uh, it's pretty interesting to see what Dylan had to say to them. Because he was pretty much just trying to belittle them and also just kind of say, yeah, you're nothing but pawns in this. You know, you really keep fighting for years on end. There is no end to this. There's always going to be someone else. There's always going to be something else that's bigger and better than you. Uh, You think this is Umbrella, you know, like this isn't Umbrella. Those days are over. Uh, Little things like that that make him obviously trying to play you up to hate him. But he comes at everybody. Dylan goes on to explain that the reason why he has these virus little drones is from Arius from Resident Evil Vendetta. And of course, that also explains why Maria is with him, too. So he kind of passed the torch on with his resources. But he's saying what I'm trying to do is much different because I can selectively choose who I want to infect with these drones and I can release them out to the world and just, you know, it won't be everybody that will be a casualty, which is, of course, what he's just saying. But like he still in his head has that like, I'm going to control this a little bit better. And uh, he just tells him that like it got, you know, he it flashes to Raccoon City again and it shows you like his vision of like why he thinks this is justified and of course he has to kill his teammate and umbrella pretty much turned him against everybody at that point and that situation so there's that you know resentment there and that revenge that he feels like he needs to get from that moment that umbrella kind of took everything from him uh but he lays into him he lays into leon he's like how do you feel working for the government who hides stuff and and creates secrets and you're burnt out you're burnt out from it, you know, admit it. And he's just like, yeah, it's a living like that. That was Leon's response. And he's like infected. He's like, it's a living, you know, he's like infected, but like it's, it's in a way he's agreeing with it. He's like, yeah, I'm burnt out and tired, but like, I'm just doing this, you know what I mean? And of course, like Chris and Claire are also just kind of chiming in saying like, you know, we're trying to protect people. He goes on and just slams Chris. He's like, Chris, the fact that you've lost a teammate on pretty much every single mission He's like, you know, you're not protecting anybody. Uh, it, it, it's it's a very funny scene in a way because you just see someone trying to dissect like everything they do and how it doesn't matter. And it's like, obviously, us fans, like we see different villains kind of mock them. But it was just very interesting to see because at this whole time, Jill is just aiming the gun at him and they're just like in the cell. Also, I wanted to mention that uh, Dr. Taylor is in the cell as well, not infected, obviously, because he wants him to, you know, pretty much suffer if Claire uh, turns on him because he's in Claire's cell. And when Leon, before Leon got infected, he noticed Taylor was there because he gave Chris and Claire a, f- a false name. And he's like, that is the guy I've been looking for. So there's also that little moment that happens where he's like, oh, shit. Yeah, this is all connected. Um but I like that. I like the fact that we got a villain that was just kind of like, you guys suck. And I'm going to tell you why you suck. Um, but obviously, like, you know, he's he's not very um, he's not as menacing as you would think. He's just kind of like he just kind of like, uh, I don't know. He, he kind of just does the Russian roulette thing and he shows up and says some stuff like, you know, has his little PTSD flashbacks. But, um, you know probably one of the weaker links in this film overall with all of these scenes combined. I mean, I like his final form and we'll talk about that when he, you know, turns into the, uh, the, uh, the Dylan, uh, shark monster, whatever you want to call it. So that brings us to Rebecca because Rebecca finishes making the cure for everybody. Well, she doesn't know that she actually needs it, but she's just making it just in case. But of course they need it. So she goes along with this team that gets wiped out in like two seconds, probably the worst team she could have been with. 
uh, to sail out to Alcatraz. Uh, they get infected by, well, they don't get infected, but they get attacked by the shark uh, that was obviously infected, the, the orca and stuff like that. So it takes all of them out, and Rebecca is able to kind of float away uh, by the skin of her teeth and has the uh, the cure for everybody. So she's able to get in there. Rebecca heals everybody, of course, and it works pretty quickly. Once everybody's healed, everyone goes and begins the final battle. But of course, Leon has to take care of Maria. Now, as he runs off and fights her, uh, he's able to impale her uh, on a piece of the wall that's like sticking out that broke when they were fighting. And uh, once she's taken care of, she doesn't really give Leon that much problems. Uh, we have the you know final confrontation with Dylan while he's alive in this state. There's also a moment where Dylan shoots Dr. Taylor from the top of the uh, catwalk that he's standing on. So he starts to bleed out. But Taylor gives Claire the passwords to stop the drones within that moment. So that's important to mention as well uh, because that is how they're going to also play into stopping this whole thing once and for all. So everything goes to the final fight Jill confronts Dylan and she's like Dylan what the hell and he's sitting there with the uh, you know with the little injector gun takes himself out says this is the ultimate final stage takes himself out falls back and uh, he gets eaten by the shark and we begin our final form of Dylan and the final battle begins and this is easily the best action sequence in the whole film right next to the uh, aquatic liquor fight and uh, it's on. It's time to finish this thing. We get a lot of good back and forth with Chris working with Jill as well as Leon uh, assisting. And we get Leon and Chris assisting together with the turret uh, truck because it's a whole armory. Where this final battle takes place is a whole armory. So they do have access to like a bunch of guns. Chris is taking out the turret gun, like shooting like Rambo. Uh, things are going off. And this scene is actually really cool. Now, Claire and Rebecca run off to try to stop the drones from the computer from obviously hatching and going all over the world uh, the way he mapped them out and obviously the passwords come in handy so they're able to override what these you know viral drones are doing and they're able to turn them against Dylan and the way that they're able to do that while they were fighting taking them you know taking them out or you know trying to hold them off uh, they were able to reverse engineer them make them infect Dylan multiple times so it messes with his chemistry and it just completely makes him almost shut down. So all this is happening. You know, you got the, the drones coming around to over-infect him. Jill also finds a plasma rifle uh, from the armory, so she's charging that up, shoots him. You know, he's strong. He's pretty big. He's like, the armory is, is a pretty big armory and he does take up a decent chunk of the room in his final form. That's what I like about the final battle is that everybody plays a major role in taking out Dylan. Of course, they're doing a bunch of things to hit him with firepower, but then you got, you know, Claire and Rebecca going off to reverse engineer the drones, overtaking the computer, over infecting Dylan. Then you have, you know, Jill, who's not only doing damage with firepower and the plasma rifle, but also, you know, luring him with the flare going underwater, pretty much has a big pipe bomb that she just throws into the shark, almost gets caught, knifes off, you know, the, the thing that's catching her, throws in the uh, the bomb. You have Leon and Chris kind of aiming this rocket launcher that shoots this door down that just cuts his head, you know, and then he just explodes underwater. Uh, really cool, just how everything kind of wraps up in this scene, in this battle scene, and it takes place in an armory, so you couldn't ask for much better action. But I will say this overall, like... If you compare the action in this movie compared to Vendetta, it's a little less over the top than Vendetta, but it still works. It's not as like, you know, just how, you know, how are they uh, doing all this damage and there's not innocent people dying. Like that kind of stuff is not really around in this. It's like still a little over the top, but just a little more tame, but in a good way. It doesn't make it seem, you know, less exciting, but you can kind of get what I'm saying if you see this right after seeing Vendetta. They finally have a conversation outside of the base once they're done. The sun's setting. They're kind of just coming to terms with what just happened. Then the fact that they did try to save, you know, as many people as they could. Obviously, they lost a bunch of people on the island again, but they completed the mission together with teamwork, with all their knowledge. Again, it was great to see all of them work together. And the helicopter's coming to pick them up as like the sun's setting in classic RE fashion. Everyone walks forward. 
Chris is kind of right behind Jill. He gives her a fist bump, says, good to have you back. And she pretty much says, good to be back, you know, and uh, they all walk off. And that's Resident Evil Death Island in a little bit of a point by point breakdown. So I kind of wanted to talk about certain points in there and certain things that worked for me, some things that didn't work for me. But overall, like this film, Death Island, I would say has to be in my top three uh, animated films, CGI animated films from Resident Evil, obviously because Jill. But it's also just the fact that we did get to see somewhat of a reunion for the most part. Uh, you know, we didn't have uh, people like Barry in there. Um, you know, that would have been really cool. But I think that they put, obviously, as much as they could without it being too overwhelming and jumping around from story to story to story. They kind of made everything meet in the middle and they explained everything. And they really did do Jill justice, I think. I think there's a lot of uh, things that I wish they did a little bit more with Jill uh, in terms of maybe going a little bit more into what happened right after RE5, maybe her condition, how long, you know, I don't expect them to explain everything, but the one thing with Jill is I did wish they kind of gave her a different aesthetic. I mean, you had people literally thinking that she was, that we were seeing Jill from RE3, you know, uh, we had people thinking that, um, you know, that she was going to be, uh, still de-aged because of the you know infection from five and that she's younger she looks younger but she's really older none of that is explained at all and it's not and and i don't even think it's a thing i think jill is probably in her 40s and that's just the way they designed her it's just a capcom thing of like well that's how we designed her re3 remake done but all the other characters kind of look older so i understand why people would think oh maybe it's the infection that all that stuff is just it, we're in our heads guys when we do stuff like that we get in our own heads you know we like to think about those possibilities but like will capcom really put that much detail into that little thing for something like that probably not they probably just want jill to be recovered you know six years later she's flipping she's doing all this stuff it's not because she had a virus in her it's just because these people that we see that are our OG characters are portrayed kind of like superheroes in many ways. And that's just the way they are. You know, they're flipping, they're doing this. She's doing the knife moves. I mean, Jill is definitely the most physical she's been since RE5. You know, obviously in RE5, she was doing the double knee drop kicks and flipping and all that stuff. So that's still kind of here in a sense, uh, you know, just in a different way. But I loved what they did with Leon and Jill. And I just want to see more. You know, if anything, this film left me wanting more but not just more of these characters and combination of characters in a cgi film but more of this in the main line of resident evil titles and i think a lot of people want to see that happen now that we got the winter story kind of coming to a close with seven and eight now with nine and with this film kind of establishing jill is back why not bring jill back why not bring our characters back, you know? Uh, and I know it's been done a bunch of times, but, like, we really haven't seen Jill in a main game in a long time. I mean, literally since Resident Evil 3. She hasn't had a game where she was the main character. She was in, you know, Resident Evil Revelations, but that was a spinoff. And I just wish that she would get the main spotlight again, or if you want to do two characters or something, whatever they want to do with, like, who it switches to and, and what happens... I don't know what their plans are for Resident Evil 9, but I think a lot of people are excited to see where it could go, uh, especially after seeing this movie, because the action was all there. It wasn't a horror film. It wasn't supposed to be a horror film. It wasn't as, you know, uh, dark or anything like that. It, it was it was more action oriented with a little spin on, you know, how these characters are doing years down the road, what they're fighting for, how it pushed these certain questions, you know, betrayal, change, growth, refusing to grow, stuck in the past. Like there's a lot of things that this movie kind of messes with, but I like the fact that they had some kind of connection to Raccoon City in this. That was kind of cool with Dylan, but Dylan was probably the weakest link, kind of more forgettable, but I can't say that I was, um, you know, uh, completely you know thrown off by a, a villain that wasn't as strong even some of the villains in these cgi films haven't been as strong and our main characters is what holds everything together and we really got to see jill and chris kind of talk about their 
losses and what they felt like they've lost about themselves, a piece of themselves, or maybe another person that, you know, it was really cool to see that back and forth with them kind of getting a little emotional with each other, but it didn't really last long. So I think some of my not like, I guess nitpicks would be, I just kind of wish we got more emotional dialogue like that or dialogue about the past or, you know, what they've been through, but I know they got to get to the next scene, get to the next action scene. I get it, but this is where games and, you know, the, the storytelling within them can also kind of expand on what this kind of set up because now we know it takes place within the game's canon, obviously all these films. So we can really see them kind of play some of the stuff forward, but I like how some of the stuff that Dylan says to them is still relevant. I mean, Chris still lost people to this day. He still loses people on missions, you know? Uh, I'm sure Leon has that burnout feeling, you know? So I, I like the fact that they had a villain that kind of brought up some of these things that even us as fans are questioning, like, are they ever going to get tired? Or does this ever end? Or will this ever end? And do they do, do the characters themselves see an end to it? Um, so... But, you know, it, it really was entertaining. It held my interest. I really enjoyed the fact that it was, you know, right under an hour and a half. It got in, it got out. It wasn't too long. It didn't have to be too long. And, you know, something like Infinite Darkness, if they were to continue that Netflix series that obviously takes place, you know, in the CGI game lore as well, um, where they could explain some of these characters a little bit better or could explain some of these sequences a bit better uh, with how these characters got to that point, uh, with a season two, but I don't really think they ever followed up on season one and they kind of just went right to this film. So, you know, I guess us fans may see that one day if they decide to turn back to that show and maybe do more of an episodic thing again. But even that show was kind of like a broken up longer film, I guess, or right around the same time as these films would be like hour 30, hour 40 minutes. So, I'm curious to see what their decision was to either ax that or not go back to it. But cause we thought a show would be a cool opportunity to kind of explain things a little bit more like a show where they don't have to completely rush to the end with a bunch of action scenes and stuff like that. But overall, I really enjoyed resident evil death Island. I thought they did a really good job for hardcore fans. And even if you're a fan, that's only played some of the remakes and the mainline games, you can still get a kick out of this. I don't think you'll know all the references and, everything that they're talking about to some points, depending on where you stopped or how long it's been since you played. But especially if you're a hardcore fan, that's well up on everything, you know, all the references, it's just going to make it a lot more enjoyable. Uh, I thought the animation was very well done. Everything looked really crisp. I thought the CGI always gets better with these films. In my opinion, it was a little questionable in infinite darkness, and I know that got some people scared, but with this, I thought it was pretty on par with Vendetta, if not better, in its animation. So they always get it smooth. They always get it down. I thought the voice acting was also very well done. I thought they really did bring that, you know, chemistry that we wanted them to have. It didn't seem like they were kind of like, you know, lost or didn't connect when they had those moments of dialogue. And uh, again, I love the music. I thought the music was a, was another great addition to this. Um, they always do a good job at, you know, keeping the stuff intense, keeping it, you know, uh, pretty short to like an hour, 20, hour, 30 minutes, because you don't want movies now just feel the need to be too long, especially with something like this, where it's like it doesn't need to be that long. So keeping it at like an hour and a half is like perfect for Resident Evil. It doesn't need to be two hours, two and a half hours. Um, in my opinion, but I think with this material, they made it work with, you know, with what they had and what they had previously kind of built with all the CGI films that have been going on since 2009. So it's pretty crazy. They've been going on for this long and there's so many different forms of Resident Evil, you know, that you can consume, but you know, 27 years onward and we're still getting stuff with our original characters. So I'm a happy guy. I just kind of want them to bring that a little bit closer to the mainline games and give us something new uh, with those characters. But we'll see what happens, you know? So I really wanted to focus this podcast on just Resident Evil Death Island and review it for you guys and discuss it in this way where I can talk about everything, all the spoilers. And I know, of course, everyone's, you know, screaming and yelling about Resident Evil 9 and the recent leaks on that um, by, you know, shitty leak channels and leaked social media stuff. And... Um, I have one thing to say about all that stuff is fuck off, basically. Um, 
because I think a lot of things are you know leaks online and I I'm not a leak channel like I'll cover leaks if they have some kind of you know weight to them if it's actually leaked information you guys know how I do it on the channel I don't like spam your feed with just shitty thumbnails and dumbass leak videos um and uh and you know these are all channels that have been made six months ago a year ago you know maybe two uh but they try to cash in on the stuff and it's sad and you know i can come on here and be like guys resident evil 9 is coming out in 2025 no shit like no fucking shit asshole you know i hate leaks that are just so obvious like it's like dude we know they're already working on re9 so I could just make a video and say like, hey guys, they're working on RE9. And it's like, we fucking know they're working on RE9. It's not, they're not going to announce it to the fucking public until they put out a trailer. Like we know how they do their sequences. They do a main game. They do a remake. They work on both simultaneously. They know their next move already. So I just think it's ridiculous that there's so much of this RE9 crap these last couple of days that people just love to, you know, check the sources and say oh well it's 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 reliable oh no it's questionable oh no it's reliable it's like which one is it motherfucker so i'm not going to sit here and, and you know talk about all that stuff uh i just think that their next announcement will it be re9 probably can they announce it this year maybe but i think that they'll probably announce separate ways sometime before they announce resident evil 9 i don't know when you know they could announce re9 at another PlayStation event next year. They can have a Capcom event. I don't know. We know it's being worked on, and it's not really news. So this being the last Resident Evil release for the year, things are winding down. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of content, obviously, on the channel, so content and podcasts will not be winding down. On the Resident Evil release end, of course, there's a little bit of a break. Uh, but as far as content, the Summer of RE is still rolling. Code Veronica is still rolling as we speak. I'm doing an LTRE uh, dive on all that stuff. So I'm doing like a, a couple live streams and I'll do a podcast like this where I talk about it um, and kind of really break everything down, dissect everything and tell you what I like about it because it's the first time Code Veronica has been featured on the channel in a couple years and it's only really been beaten a few times. So I want to explore that more, uh, a bunch more videos and, you know, podcasts that I want to work on as well. So, you know, I'll keep busy with a bunch of that stuff. Of course, I'm also still doing Silent Hill 2. On the stream as well that all you uh, fellow members and patreon supporters voted on so a lot of other survival horror stuff i'm going to be playing as well as later this year when it comes out so uh, that's going to be a lot of fun and uh, yeah i'm just going to keep the content going i'm going to keep the podcast going and i also have a whole episode coming out uh in the next week uh another episode so soon i know but it's going to be me discussing my uk trip and my experience there uh, I meant to do that when I came back, but if you guys were listening to the other live streams, I had some computer troubles when I got back from the UK, so I wasn't able to get that episode like fresh in the can right when I got back from the UK, but uh, obviously I still remember plenty from it, so I will recap that and also do that for a podcast episode. So that'll probably be the next show, and then I'm going to try to have some other stuff planned for you guys um, to finally finish the Resident Evil films, uh, those review like the live action films and stuff like that even to go back and review the other CGI films. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to just get the ball rolling. I'm going to stop being afraid to take more risks and I'm just going to keep it going guys, but I definitely have to, you know, just keep pushing this summer because I need to build another PC that will also help me hopefully for another 10 years, you know, um, and uh, you know, doing more, on my film channel, doing more on a potential third channel that will just focus on other things so I can, you know, expand a little bit more. Uh, so that's all in the cards. Um, yeah, but I just have to, like, be a lot more urgent with some of this stuff. All I can do is try. And, you know, I, I'm not going to be a leak channel. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to sell out and do this dumb shit, you know, where, yeah, I'm just not going to do it. And, um, but thank you for always watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Obviously, hit the like button if you haven't. You know, check out LTRE on all the socials, Twitter, Discord, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Um, of course, the Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and Libsyn stuff's always free for the podcast. You can download all your stuff there. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to enjoy the rest of the summer 
uh, making content, doing live streams, and uh, we're just going to make it a good one. So even though there's no RE on the horizon as of now, we will still make the best of it. There's a bunch of mods I can play. I've already did the Nemesis mod, which is hilarious. So there's a lot of fun in there uh, to be had. So there's a lot of stuff that I can do in the meantime is basically what I'm saying uh, in the lull period uh, that is RE right now, where now that this is out, now what? Um, but as an RE slash survival horror channel, there's plenty more for me to do. So I'm going to keep doing it. Stay tuned for more podcasts. Stay tuned for more content. Thank you for everybody who's ever taken the time just to watch my channel out of the a thousand Resident Evil channels that are now here. <laughs> because yeah, when, when the chat, when this channel was created, there was probably, you know, maybe 10 or 15 channels that were RE, including mine that were like consistently putting out RE content or RE based. Um, now it's like, it's everywhere. So, uh, which is fine. It's great. But again, within that, you get people that are just trying to make channels to cash in uh, or make a channel a year ago because of RE4. And now they're, you know, in it for the wrong reasons. It's one thing when you do it for the right reasons. I'm not, you know, gatekeeping at all. You can make as many channels as you want, but when you're doing it for, you know, leaks or if you're not even an RE channel and you're just, you know, jumping your subject to RE leaks and then because that will be popular and then Starfield leaks will be popular the next week for you. Like that kind of like jumping to thing to thing just doesn't make sense. Or even if you're just doing it within the genre, it's still very annoying and oversaturating. But me saying shit on here is not going to do anything. I just have to keep doing what I'm doing and make better content. So when people say, well, where's your content? I'm like, I have 13 years of content. Uh, so, and counting. So there you go. So I can pat myself on the back for that one. But thank you guys for uh, for watching, listening. Hope you enjoy Death Island. Enjoy it. You'll love it. And uh, stay tuned for more LTRE content. And I will catch everyone in the next one. Take care.